Well, good morning. Welcome to the weekend. I'm Brian Maine. This is Garden America. My uh, colleagues, my good buddies, my co host host themselves, John Bagnasco, Tiger Palafox. Welcome to the weekend. We do hope you had a good uh, week leading up to the weekend, and we're glad that you could spend part of your weekend with us here on Garden America. It's always good to see you. Yes, we do see you as you see us every weekend. And those on BizTalk Radio, welcome once again. A reminder to those on uh, BizTalk Radio to catch our show live. You can go to our Facebook page. Garden America Radio Show, and you can interact with us live. Those that have been waiting, thank you for your patience. Again, on just a little bit later, but we do appreciate your patience and the fact that we are there and you are right there as well. John, I have no idea what I just said in the last 30 to 60 seconds. Can you give us a recap? (laughs) I don't know, but the first 10 minutes were some of the most riveting radio I've heard in a long time. It was compelling. Oh, my gosh. Thank you, Tiger, for getting us on again. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and, but here's the funny part. Tiger's not even sure what he did. Or are you? No. I, I mean, everything was done right. I don't understand sometimes why these things don't just do what they're supposed to do. Hey, technology <laughs> and, and Facebook. So, hey, thank yeah. you for those uh, tuning in. There's Gina. There's Astam. There's uh, Dana. Hello there. Good and morning. And welcome to another edition of Garden America, John, as we like to say and have said for the past 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> wow. It's a long time when you think about it. It is a long time. So we've got, uh, in San Diego, another week of hot weather coming up. Hot weather is 79 degrees. Oh, for you, it's but I've got what? like 96, 97 by me. Well, hey, just maybe wait. that'll feel cool this no, time just, around, John. Yeah, just wait till you get that 96 with also 20-mile-an-hour winds. <laughs> That's coming up, right? I mean, October. October's going to be here. Oktoberfest, beer, German beer, that whole time of the year. I've done some spots for Oktoberfest uh, lately. So so you were watching the news this week, and it was the first day of fall, right? Right. And then how everybody comments on how, like what John said. You usually have an autumnal (laughs) equinox party, and I wasn't invited this year. I haven't invited you in five years. (laughs) But I came. Doesn't that tell you something? Yeah, but I still came the last four. Well, peeking through the window doesn't count. Oh, okay. But it's just funny because everybody's commenting on how, oh, the first day of fall, but, you know, not here in San Diego. That means nothing. It's, you know, 85 degrees and you, sunny. In San Diego and, and surrounding areas, you can't depend on the calendar for any kind of a weather forecast. And you Do you know, know this... one of the differences, though, that, that uh, the autumnal equinox does make is that we have shorter days. Mm-hmm. So even when it gets really hot, uh, it's not as stressful on plants yeah. because it's a shorter period of time. Yeah, shorter period of time, less evaporation. Always yeah, looking yeah. for the positive, aren't you? It is. <laughs> it's, then, sometimes so, it's hard. So I know John driving in this morning just had a magical view. Because as you're driving down the 15, sometimes you hit some of those uh, areas where you can see you know, a, a good distance. And it had that pink clouds that sky. That sunrise was, was beautiful. Wasn't it gorgeous? It was like an artist just took a canvas. Yes. And started painting. And then it's so funny because only in a matter of minutes, it goes from pink from the sunrise right. to a blue uh, sky with white clouds. And, you know, because the sun has then just breached that atmospheric layer and now the, the colors are gone. But even then seeing the clouds was gorgeous because it was those it was those scattered pattern clouds, almost like a, 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 right, a right, quilt right. over the sky, you know, it was very pretty. Let's welcome our listener from Trinidad. Oh, welcome. Is that Tootsie? Yeah. First time, right? right. Well, welcome. Yeah, absolutely. So hey, who's our guest in... today, by the way? Yeah, we're going to be we talking should... with Ben Pfeiffer from Fireflies.org, and we're going to be talking Fireflies. I mean, being a San Diego native, uh-huh. Fireflies just have always intrigued me because we don't have them here. We don't have them, right. But there are native fireflies to California, and Ben's going to mention some of those. Right, but they're not as spectacular as the ones. I've never to. seen one, or if I have, I. And some of those pictures on Firefly.org, the website of like fields just glowing, yeah, and and then those time lapse photos where they just are crossing the sky and everything. I, I don't know. I've seen fireflies twice in my life, and I'll just never forget that. And you know, it, one time years so ago, fun. we we took an RV across country, and we stopped in this area in Oklahoma. I mean, nothing for miles around, just fields. We camped there at night and fireflies everywhere. Really? And I was young enough to where I'm outside kind of running around trying to catch them. I, I was just in awe. Yeah. Everywhere. I'm like, how does, how does this work? Yeah. Where do they get their electricity from? That's <laughs> do you know what, what I wanted they eat? to know. Do you know what they eat? No. They eat, they eat something that allows them to glow. 
Algae? They do? No, they eat <laughs> snails. Oh. You wouldn't the, think that, like, would Like you? the garden snails? Yeah. That, that's what they're Yeah, they're, so it would be great carnivore. if we could have yeah. fireflies here. Yeah. The, the, the adult is the firefly or lightning bug. Uh-huh. They're called sometimes, right? Uh, sometimes they don't eat at all, but it's the larval stage. Oh, okay. So yeah. the crawling around on the ground stage finds right. these snails, eats them. Oh, interesting. You know, you need a nickname like that, Firefly. <laughs> hey, where's old Firefly? Is he going to be here today? Anyway, it'll be interesting to see what's going on. <laughs> yes. I'm excited because fireflies intrigue me, and I wish I could have some. Yeah, they do. There's like, something I'm, about and I'm, I'm going to ask Ben, why, can't, why don't we have them here in San Diego? If we, you created an environment for them, because garden environments are supposed to be good for them, right? Yeah. So I wonder if you could possibly create an environment and then import some. Right. I mean, you know, why not take it? If they eat snails, I mean, that's not really bad. You know, it's not like there's some going to be, you know, I don't, I can't, I can't imagine they're going to be some invasive species of bug that's going to just take over well, some of their we'll population. we'll find out. I yeah. did see that, uh, and Ben's going to tell us about it, but you can have a, a firefly habitat sign put up in your yard, right? Yeah, because he was talking about, like you mentioned, there's right. special garden elements right. that you add to your yard that will attract them, like any other bug. This uh, summer, we visited my son in Indianapolis, Joe, and... Almost every night we just sit on the back patio and watch the Firefly so show. Cool. It so really cool. was. Yeah. Well, yeah, so we're going to be talking with Ben today about Fireflies. I think a lot of people across the country, across the world, are intrigued by this bug. Because, I mean, J- Brian, do you know any other bug that glows? I mean. Glow worms. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. I just first thing that came to my mind. Have you ever been to the glow, glow worm cave in New Zealand? Well, obviously not. <laughs> but but you are, and I know that you're setting this up for a conversation because no, it, you have been there. I have been, and it it was it was very interesting. Yeah. Um, Carla, by the way, is looking forward to today's discussion. She says it should be very enlightening. Oh, well played, Carla. <laughs> yeah, well, well played. Well played. Yeah, very good. A little yeah. bit of a video freeze here and there, so maybe okay. during the break we'll. Uh, We'll take a look at that, so thank you for letting us know about that. Mike says, hi, good morning, guys. Rick says, good morning. Okay, so we've got a good show. Again, Fireflies, this has, has seems to have tickled the fancy of some of our viewers uh, this morning, so that'll be with uh, Ben, as uh, Tiger and John mentioned after the first break. John has the quote of the week. Quote of the week's a poem. It's a long one again. I saw that, and I went, oh, boy, here we go. It's from. It's by Robert Frost. Along with that great newsletter, John. And it's called Fireflies in the Garden. How timely. Yeah. It says, uh, the poem goes, Here comes real stars to fill the upper skies. And here on earth, some emulating flies. (laughs) That though they never equal stars in size, and they never really were stars at heart, achieve at times a very star-like start. Only, of course, they can't sustain the part. Go ahead, finish the book. (laughs) (laughs) And that was Robert Frost. Robert Frost. Do you know that uh, he was the uh, the poet laureate that spoke at the inauguration? And I remember this. I remember it being winter in the uh, inauguration uh, of John F. Kennedy. I was going to say John F. Kennedy. Yeah. And I think he died, if I'm not mistaken, the same year Kennedy was shot. 1963. Right. December, I mean, November 22nd? You know, one of the most famous things he wrote was um, Two Roads Diverged in a Wood. Do you remember that? And I I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Well, you know what Yogi Berra said? When you get to the fork in the road, take it. Take it. (laughs) I don't think Yogi was ever the poet laureate. (laughs) He tried. He did try. He did his best. In his own way. Did Tiger give you the phone number for our guest? Yes, he did, and uh, we seem to be ready to go during the break. We'll check a couple of uh, technical things here on our Facebook Live feed to make sure we're set up and ready to go. We've got just about a minute before our break. Any? Uh, how was your week, uh, Tiger? I always have to Good. ask what's going on at the nursery. Uh, busy week, getting ready for pumpkins, getting ready for oh, fall, yeah. You know, decorating the nursery, doing Do all you that know, kind of stuff. I was at Albertsons last month uh-huh. and saw this huge... Uh, crate of pumpkins. pumpkins. 
why would you want a pumpkin the end of August, beginning of September? <laughs> like, what are you supposed to do with it? Well, it's the same hey. reason why in July it's because, you start seeing Christmas commercials. It's because October 12th, they're probably going to be out of pumpkins and putting up Christmas stuff. Uh, yeah. Right. Okay, that said, we're going to take a break. Thank you for tuning in. We're going to bring our guest on right after the break. A lot of people I see uh, joining us on Facebook Live, so uh, stay right there. It should be a fascinating, interesting show about fireflies. I'm Brian Main, John Bagnasco, Tiger Palafox, those on BizTalk Radio. Welcome to the show. This is a recorded show from last week. Speaking of BizTalk Radio, we're going to take a break. Back after these messages from our good friends and our great sponsors on BizTalk Radio. Okay, we have returned. Welcome back to the show. This is Garden America. Hope you enjoyed that break there on BizTalk Radio. Those on Facebook Live, okay, John is snickering. What what did we do, John? What did I do? Well, I'm just thinking, you know, I hope you enjoyed that break. (laughs) Yeah, you know. (laughs) Do you ever want people to call in and say what they did during that break? That's Find a li- out if you really enjoyed it. That's a little invasive, but uh, yeah, whatever we do here, whether it's a break or the show, we hope you enjoyed that break. All right. So that's going to be something we say from now on, John. I hope you did enjoy that break. Hey, uh, that was a lot of ado. Yeah. So without further ado, I'm going to toss it to Tiger. Tiger's going to bring our guest on. We're going to talk about fireflies, those on Facebook Live. Questions, comments, we welcome them, Tiger. All right. We have, uh, thanks for being patient, Ben. And we have Ben Pfeiffer from Firefly.org joining us this morning. To talk about fireflies. Now, you know, Ben, you have a, a great history of fireflies because, um, you know, in your bio, it kind of leads to you're almost raised with this interest in this bug. And then it carried on through your life and you grew up in a region where, you know, you were able to study the habitats and get to know them. And, you know, I'm imagining then it became your your life's work. So what an interesting um, creature. <laughs> to to have um, a passion for because I think most people are just amazed by fireflies. It, is is it one of those things that even when you live in an area that you have fireflies, you still every night look out in awe, Ben? Yeah, I really do. Um, you know, one of the beautiful things about studying fireflies is just like the flash patterns and the diversity that you get to see out there. So it always blows me away when I go into a habitat and I can read the landscape, you know, and read what's out there and just, I get to see the most incredible things. So yeah, it still blows me away every time. And it's one of the reasons why it's become a passion for me. I just heard a term that I'm wondering if there's more to it, flash pattern. Yeah, definitely. And Ben, you're going to talk a little bit about that um, you know, but before we get into too much more, can you explain what a firefly is? Like, um, what it eats, where it lives, why it does glow? Yeah. Uh, so it's a good question. So fireflies are beetles, essentially. Um, they're in, mm-hmm. um, the group Cleoptera, which contains around 400,000 species worldwide. So it's a really diverse group. Um, in that, uh, group, they're in the family Lampyridae. Um, which 
basically as adults and juveniles, they glow, um, and that's a characteristic of fireflies. Um, and so there, it's a, a pretty diverse amount of, of species that we have here in the United States. It's about 180 to 200 species. Um, and where I'm at in Texas, we've got about 40 to 45. Mm. Um, but regarding the flash patterns, um, each species kind of uh, tends to have its own unique flash pattern. Um, and that kind of differentiates it uh, between other species in the night when they're, you know, during mating season. Uh, so a female can find a male. Um, and uh, in terms of what they eat, um, most fireflies don't eat when they're adults. And what a lot of people don't know is that fireflies stay in the larval state for about one to two years. And then as adults, they only really live um, anywhere from two to four weeks. Oh, wow. Um, and so it's a really short period. Wow. Um, and during that time, they don't need to eat. Um, now, there are some uh, genuses of fireflies in the Futurus group that do eat, and they eat their own kind, essentially. Um, <laughs> and there's several reasons they do that. Uh, but they do have um, mandibles, and they're able to chew. And occasionally, I've had one bite me, um, <laughs> you know, when you try to hold it in your hand. Uh, so they've got different strategies um, when, you know, as opposed to different other genuses. But for the most part, they don't eat a lot. They think as, as larva for um, the science group out there, they think as larva that they probably eat um, potentially roots, um, like milkweed roots or uh, other types of in- insects or stuff that's like in the soil or in the mud, basically. And then they might obtain these compound defensive compounds that make them poisonous from these plants and stuff and or at least the precursors uh, uh, uh that they can produce those things so that's kind of about um you know most of the 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 life cycle of firefly it's pretty short um as an adult and you know as a juvenile they last for uh, a good amount of time that's why when we w- look at fireflies and we're trying to protect them we're trying to really protect f- uh, larval habitat um, and then also females as well. It, it's interesting you mention Asclepius because, you know, we all know Asclepius is a big monarch butterfly plant. I mean, it's its host plant. That's what it eats. Um, you know, and monarchs only go after Asclepius. They don't go after, you know, a wide variety of plants. Um, so fireflies, that plant is important to it as well. So if you are a, uh, a monarch person, and you live in a region where you have fireflies, that's also a good plant to introduce to your garden for fireflies as well? Yeah, I, I would say it would be. Um, it's, it's a little bit inconclusive. We're not quite sure, um, but there is some. Um, there was some research that was done to look at Asclepius like in terms of fireflies that were in the same area, and they did find some larva potentially um, you know, at the base like possibly eating the roots. Um, mm. So there has been scientific research into this um, and a look at that. The reason why they're chewing that or they're, they're doing that is they're trying to get these compounds that are like essentially similar to cardiac glycosides, which are, which uh, was a heart medication um, that was called like digitalis basically back in the day. Now it's something different, but these compounds that make fireflies poisonous are very similar to these um, compounds that, um, are used for like treating heart conditions, um, and it's the same, very similar to things that monarchs also have as well. Um, okay, that make them poisonous. poisonous. Um, so, you know, it's curious, right? Now, yeah. um, there's some research being done right now in terms of the firefly microbiome. It's brand new. I'm um, going. I'm um, a research uh, mentor on it, and they're looking at to see if the reasons why that they how they manufacture these compounds is from actually getting them from somewhere else, these precursor compounds. So interesting research out there. And I would say if you have a, a butterfly garden, planting uh, milkweed definitely is going to uh, help fireflies as well. Okay. Um, what what makes a uh, firefly glow? Well, what is that process that's happening? Well, in I the can bar? answer that. There are firefly charging stations, right, Ben? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> EV charging stations. They yes. just like... Hook right in, you know, and then they're charged, and they can go on. <laughs> but yeah, good, only, good they question. can only go 300 miles, but they got to plug them in. <laughs> yeah, they're they're working on that though. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, getting back to Tiger's question, what is the glow from? How does that work? Yeah, so that's a great question, um, and a lot of people are, are want to know about that, and so uh, 
how they work is that there is um, different compounds inside their light organs, and these are compounds called luciferase and luciferin. And what they do when they come together, one's a um, amino acid and an enzymatic catalyst. And when fireflies breathe in oxygen, basically they charge up the luciferin molecule um, inside. Um, their abdomen, and that basically excites that molecule until it charges all the way up, and then it basically releases photons of light, um, okay. and they're oxygen atoms, essentially. Um, and so there's actually a, a, a formula for bioluminescence, interestingly hey, enough. Hey, um, Ben, the ben of that, uh, before you get too much farther, sorry, do, we do have to interrupt. Yeah. We're going to have to take a break real quick because it's so exciting to learn about fireflies and learn about how they glow. So thank you very much. When we get back, we'll continue chatting with Ben Pfeiffer from Firefly.org. Right. Keep your train of thought, Ben, because we're discussing how they light up. Uh, what is the actual process? So, again, it is break time for our friends on uh, BizTalk Radio, coming back even quicker here on Facebook Live. So do stay with us. I'm Brian Main, John Bagnasco, Tiger Palafox. Welcome to another edition of Garden America. All righty, we are back thanking those on uh, BizTalk Radio. Big thanks to our sponsors. Back here on Facebook Live, we are talking about fireflies uh, today, gang. And just before the break, uh, Tiger, Ben was discussing, based on our questions, how they glow, how that works. Let's get back to that. Yeah, Ben, you were just talking about how, you know, when they breathe in, the oxygen um, uh, initiates a, a reaction in them. So, and you were talking about amino acids going along with that. <laughs> Yeah, um, it's an um, enzyme and an enzymatic catalyst that goes in with it. One's called luciferase and one's called luciferin. And um, it uh, basically how it works is that fireflies breathe in oxygen. Um, uh, and, and what it does is it those oxygen ions charge that luciferin molecule. Um, and it's a chemical. Um, uh, there's a chemical formula for this particular reaction. Um, and once that luciferin gets charged up, it gets to an excited state, uh, it basically releases uh, those oxygen atoms as photons of light, um, and that's kind of how it works. So fireflies regulate their flashing based on their breathing, essentially. Um, and so if you ever look at a firefly abdomen really close, it looks like kind of like miniature lightning, essentially. So there's like a chain of these, uh, you know, reactions that are going on, um, and breathing in oxygen basically, like, excites all of those molecules um, at, at once. And then when they stop breathing or relax, then you can kind of see the leftover, like kind of miniature lightning look into it. So it's very fascinating. Um, one of the cool things is that the, the difference of the shape of that amino acid, um, uh, it basically is differentiates the type of color of light. So um, some glows you're going to see are going to be more in the amber uh, nanometer range, um, whereas uh, other fireflies you see are going to be more in the yellow, greenish kind of uh, section. Does that reaction only occur to, at night, or are they? Is it occurring during the day and you don't see it? Um, it mainly only occurs at night. Now, fireflies kind of have a, a narrow window that they are active, um, and it's pretty pronounced and pretty, uh, you know, good habitats that you you that I go into, um, they'll come out at nine 30 and then they'll be done at 10 30. Um, oh, yeah. um, and so, uh, they rarely flash during the day that I've ever seen. Um, now if you keep them in captivity, for example, you might get some flashes during the day. Okay. Hey, let's make sure let's back up. I think we have some questions. Uh, John going back to around where Patty said the first one she saw was back in 1980. <laughs> we've, we've, we've got a few uh, since then. I want to make sure we don't miss anybody here. Well, we did have a um, uh, listener in uh, Pakistan that mentioned that they're called, let's see, I'm trying to, I missed it. It was something like uh, Jungu. Uh, that's what they call it in Pakistan? Is yeah. That, that, that's the name for a yeah, firefly? Yeah, so they have them there. And then we had another listener that uh, said they have two species or two varieties that she knows of anywhere in Trinidad. And um, and then, of course, we have a question that I think we're probably going to come to pretty soon anyway uh, yeah. about uh, why we don't have them in Southern California. And my, and my question to add on to that would be, would it be possible to <laughs> import them if you had the right 
garden environment in California, Southern but, California. But if we did import them, would that be a detriment to the environment? Mm, I don't know. It's kind of weird. What, what do you think, Ben? <laughs> Um, you could, I don't know how successful they would be, um, in California. A lot of these species are really, uh, specific to, um, the actual region that they're in. Um, and they've actually tried this. They actually tried to bring fireflies to Hawaii, for example. Um, and they brought, I think this is around the fifties. And so if you look at, uh, field guides from the fifties of Hawaii, they list fireflies as one of the resident species, but, they never were there initially, and they didn't. They only lasted for a couple of years, um, so it's kind of hard to to relocate them now. Japan has had some pretty good eff, uh, um, efforts of repopulating their species that have disappeared through industrialization over the years um, in parts of their country, but it was with a lot of work that they did that, and they were never able to recover all their diversity. Um, so, might be a little too arid um, in certain parts. Um, and most of them need kind of some kind of water source. I um I I think I butchered the uh, the Urdu language from <laughs> Pakistan. The, the the over there they're called J U G N O O, which would be Jugnu. Yeah, you, your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> All right. Um, hey, I think sorry that about might be that. Indie. Um, that I've heard that word before. Oh, um, okay. Hey, so so Ben, you you know you mentioned in Japan they had some uh, issues uh, with industrialization, which then decreased the population. And now, you know that is something you're working on as well as finding in our own areas. You know there are some populations that are decreasing and having problems. Um, what are some things that cause firefly populations to drop? And then for general people, like in your own backyard, what are some things that people can do to um, you know, in, increase the population if they have them already? Yeah, good question. Um, so, so there's a, a, a several reasons why fireflies are declining across um, the world in the United States. Um, and there's there are some things that you can do in order to help them. Um, some of the main reasons uh, for decline are habitat loss. Um, and so this is uh, basically areas that are going to a land conversion process from uh, previous uh, native habitat uh, to... A commercial or residential development. So this land conversion is really an issue. Uh, it's something that's gone on for a long time. You know, used to, uh, it was conversion to agricultural fields, for example. Um, and so this was something around the turn of the 19th century that we saw and in, into this, uh, into the 20th century. Um, and so now we're, it's a lot of conversion to actually res- residential and housing. Um, and so that disappearance, once they're gone, they're gone. You know, it's just, that's it. The degradation of the habitat and starts to take effect. Um, and then you've got a cascade of, of, of insect diversity, basically. Um, and so uh, that loss of habitat's a, a big one. Um, light pollution is another issue in some ways. Um, it's basically that males can't see females and females can't see males, vice versa, when they flash at each other because the light gets in between those signals. Um, and so that's, that's one of the issues. Um, uh, some of the other uh, reasons uh, is ha- having to do with uh, pesticide usage. So um, th- there is some, you know, thoughts that, you know, people that are spreading uh, broad-spectrum pesticides um, around in their yards, it's going to kill firefly larvae that are crawling along the ground or in the soil, and in many cases it will, uh, especially for kind of like water-soluble pesticides. Um, and then, um, you know, there's other, other reasons um, out there in terms of, of why they're, they're disappearing um, is, you know, related to uh, loss of, like, aquifers, basically. Um, and as the aquifers, like, kind of drain and go lower and lower, um, those previous areas where there were seeps or springs and stuff like that are kind of disappearing, and in turn, fireflies are kind of going away. Uh, so... Uh, there's some ways that you can help um, fireflies. Um, if you've got uh, places that um, uh, you can protect, um, you got land you can protect or parks or places that you know um, that, that you've seen fireflies in, um, do what you can to protect them. Advocate for uh, local policies for um, reducing light pollution, for example. Uh, certify your habitat. You can now... Um, uh, firefly.org uh, launched a new uh, certified firefly habitat program, um, and you can purchase a sign to put up 
to let other people know that this is a firefly habitat and it needs to be protected. Um, so that's brand new as of this year, and you can find that at firefly.org. Um, another ways you can do is plant native um, species of uh, plants in your area. So if you're like to, if you're a gardener or um, if you um, you like native plants and you want to return them, um, try to plant plants that would be beneficial to fireflies. Um, and so these are ones that kind of retain soil moisture, for example. Um, some species of fireflies um, don't need like a like a, a, a riparian corridor like right next door uh, to them or nearby, which is basically like that vegetation along a river. Um, so they can survive in like urban suburban areas, for example. So um, providing good plants for them, uh, to hide, um, to like, you know, they, they go somewhere during the day, right? So <laughs> um, clumps of grass are really helpful. Um, any native plants are, are beneficial. Um, you can stop mowing native spots. Um, so if you've got like land that's along a river um, or in an area that's near a green belt, stop mowing all the way to it. Let it kind of recover a bit okay. um, and hey. let things kind of return. Hey, Ben, um, real quick, then- um, we're going to have to take another break. Sorry to interrupt again. Um, But we're talking with Ben Pfeiffer from Firefly.org. And uh, when we get back, we'll continue um, chatting with Ben about fireflies and what you can do to help the population. And a very active Facebook page, so keep those questions, comments coming. Talking to Ben Pfeiffer, as Tiger mentioned, about uh, fireflies, something most of us are very interested in because we only see them in certain parts of the country. Those on BizTalk Radio, we're going to take a break for these messages. The rest of us on Facebook Live, the uh, break will be even quicker. So do stay with us. John is here, Tiger is here, I'm here. Let's do it after these messages on BizTalk Radio. Okay, we have returned. Uh, those on BizTalk Radio, thank you for tuning in. This is a pre-recorded show from last week. And, of course, uh, those of you on Facebook, thank you for your interaction. The questions, the comments, Ben Pfeiffer, we're talking about uh, fireflies today, Tiger. And, John? Yeah, so Ben was just describing to us the environment that the fireflies need to be able to to thrive in. And, you know, Ben, we had a guest on, I think it was last week, Ed Ballou, the uh, pond professor. Right. Oh, right. And, and you know, Ben, this gentleman, you know, does water features, ponds, all kinds of wonderful things. And he had just came from creating some kind of turtle sanctuary. Right. Can't remember which turtle it was. Very unique turtle for one of the zoos. I'm like, I think I think Ed might be able to kind of work on some kind of firefly pond because it kind of seems like that's the environment that they need, a little bit of a wetland um, area to kind of be able to thrive and, you know, specialize in having a little firefly pond sanctuary design <laughs> going on a as well. A little landscape around there. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, it, you know, this, this is so intriguing, um, with these fireflies and, you know, I am so jealous of people that do have them, Ben. Um, I, I really hope that, you know, you're bringing an awareness to people needing to help preserve them. will you know, allow people in those areas to gain some education on what they can do and their part. And I know Firefly.org has a lot of information um, and resources on the website, correct? Yes, uh, there's a lot of uh, resources on the website and information uh, for people that want to learn more, everything from um, plants to consider to, uh, to plant. Um, there's some gardening tips uh, for gardeners as well. Uh, there's some in reasons like why there's a certain decline. There's a field guide. Uh, there's the Firefly Certified Habitat sign uh, section that you can go ahead and check out um, as well um, and purchase a sign there if you're interested. Uh, those signs are great gifts for the holidays or for people that are really interested in wildlife um, and don't um, you're hard to buy for. And so this is a new thing, brand new, that probably they never heard of. So uh, something to, t- to take a look at. Um, but, yeah, they can go over there. Um, if they have any questions or anything, they can also reach out to me uh, via the contact form on the website, uh, and I'm usually happy to answer any questions uh, they have regarding fireflies. Awesome. Yeah, so much good information. Uh, thank you very much. Sorry for us running a little bit late on you, Ben, but um, thanks for being patient and joining us this morning. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah. All right. Look forward to chatting again. Bye-bye. Yeah, a lot of good information. Thank you, Ben. And uh, there he goes, the firefly guy, Ben Pfeiffer. Yeah, that's so neat as far as that that bug, that creature, 
you know, and I mean, it, it seems like it's an important part of our, our ecosystem in the sense of, you know, it, it eats bugs, it, it's in the ground, um, but I mean, when they're flying around I know, it's amazing. and you just see them flickering through the bushes, yeah. that's, the, that's the real cool part. Well, you know, I mentioned we'd sit on the patio at my son's in Indianapolis and watch them, and he's he's uh, two streets over from a lake, huge oh, lake. Oh yeah. wow! And there must be there's, everywhere. There's what? Yeah, and there were also a lot of bats at night, and I was thinking, you know, those fireflies are going to light up and <laughs> show the bats where they are, but I didn't realize That's Ben cool. mentioned that they're poisonous yeah. to other uh, animals because yeah. of what they eat. And it's interesting yeah. because those animals know they're poisonous. Yeah. yeah. So they, they stay away from them. Yeah, they I mean, only live, what do you say, how many, how long do they a live? Couple weeks, a couple weeks. Like right? A couple of weeks. Yeah. It's like a butterfly. Some butterflies. It, is, it, it really is where, you know, a butterfly, you know, yeah. emerges from its cocoon and it never eats again kind of a thing. Yeah, that and little that's white the, butterfly you see flickering along there, flittering along. That's a cabbage along. moth. The yeah. cabbage moth, uh, you know, a week from now, he's not going to be around. <laughs> no, no, they're always there. Yeah, they're always there. <laughs> well, those, that particular one. Those, yeah. things are, those things are the weeds right. of the butterfly. Yeah. I, I always exactly. tell people. The Bermuda grass of I, butterflies. <laughs> I always tell people the difference between a moth and a butterfly is a moth is something that you don't want, and a butterfly is the one that you do want. Right, right, right. <laughs> a few of our listeners are asking, uh, Michael and uh, Lenore uh, and Patty are asking about uh, if we have fireflies here in San Diego. And in Southern California, there's no fireflies that are as bright as the ones back east. Yeah. But in the mountains, there's two species, uh, and they, they're not quite as bright. They don't light up as much, mm -hmm. uh, and you would rarely, uh, you know, unless you're out hiking in the mountains, you'd rarely come into contact with them. In the mountains of Southern California? Right. Like oh, the okay. Santa like Monica. San, San Bernardino and, Mountains right. or somewhere they have them. They just right. have a, but they have, they a have dull some glow. good populations up in Northern California, right? I, I, I don't know, but I would think so because yeah. it would be uh, climates that would be similar. Similar, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, then, was and, asking, and people always talk about the humidity, but it's it's you know the, the humidity is important. But they're also not. Um, they, they're also in areas where they get real cold, so it's one of those bugs that kind of go dormant in the winter time. And right, and that was one of out. the questions: is what happens to them in the winter? Do you still see them? No, you no. don't see them in the winter. Yeah, it's kind of like a hibernate right. there in you the know, ground. You know, if it was all about humidity, then they would have done better in Hawaii. Right, and that's what it seems I like think the that's perfect what they, environment. You know, you you know, you're figuring out it's it's not just about a hot, humid environment. It, mm -hmm. You know, it might be a thing that does need to rest, like a like an apple tree or like a cherry. In the winter time, as well, in order to repopulate, um, you know, you know, and and I think it's just intriguing. Okay, I didn't want to drag on Ben too much more, but he was talking about how the um, respiratory cycle is what causes the flicker. You know, the breathing right, in and out. Right. So I'm 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 in the back of my head thinking, well, what about those really unhealthy fireflies that are a little bit overweight <laughs> and like they're having a tough time. Or they you know, COPD or yeah, something. <laughs> exactly. And uh, you know, they're breathing a little too heavy. It's, it's, someone's going to mistake it for the wrong type, right? Exactly. You know? <laughs> they got to be healthy. You know, they got to be able to keep that breathing cycle happening. They're just, they're just amazing. I just, you know, <laughs> fireflies. No, I'm trying to think or of lightning bugs as as a yeah. somebody in the Midwest. Midwest. June, yeah, June. a lot of people call them lightning bugs. Yeah. Um, June bugs is something different. No, no. What did you say, June? June. What was the, oh. the Indian name? Uh, Trinidad, right? Trini Trinidad. Or was it Trinidad? Where they were saying it was No, no, June? that was uh, in Urdu. So it was yeah. our listener from Pakistan. I yeah. I think it was um, uh, Jugnu. Something? Yeah. Something like that. But it kind of sounds like after talking with Ben, too, that uh, lightning bug is a better term for it because the process of yeah. making that light, he said, is more like lightning. Like, lightning. like right. it starts at one end, kind of works to the other yeah. end. Yeah. Just not as far to go. <laughs> <laughs> How about Carla's uh, comment, John? Did you see that? The scientific explanation of their glow is interesting, but diminishes the pure wonder of it all. <laughs> I think it makes it even more uh, wonderful because to imagine that, uh, um, that God would create something like that. Oh, yeah. You know, it's just like, how'd you think of that? <laughs> I like how the the word for fly is fly. What does it do? It flies. Call it a fly. Hmm. It's like an orange, right? It's it's orange. Call it an orange. 
Nothing real scientific about that. So on those notes, we're going to take a break because we have news coming up here on Biz Talk Radio. We are back at about uh, six minutes after. Hopefully you do carry uh, both hours or at least one of the hours here on Biz Talk Radio. Facebook Live coming back even quicker, so get those questions, comments ready. Whatever's on your mind here on Garden America. Happy weekend. Welcome back to the show. This is Garden America. For those that are just joining us, welcome. Hop on board the Garden America train. Those on Biz Talk Radio, this is our number two. Thank you so much. And a big thank you to our network help, uh, the team of uh, Stephanie and all those people who make it possible for Garden America to be on the radio, to be on Biz Talk Radio each and every weekend. And, of course, those of you who tune in on Facebook Live. Brian, we have a question from a listener that uh, I think you would do well answering. Do you now? I do. She wants to know, uh, or they want to know, what plant can easily be grown in water, glass jar? Oh, apothos. Yeah. Pothos. Anything in the philodendron, philodendron family. Philodendron. They do, they do well. I mean, yeah. this is ridiculous, this experiment that I have going on here for the past five years. <laughs> it's all roots, a little bit of water. But I would say for the for the novice just starting, it's been here for five years with no nothing. light, no natural light, no natural light. I don't even uh, think those roots are still connected to. The, <laughs> I think they they're might all not be floating dead roots right. in there. But I mean, look at that. It, it's just it has no business being alive and growing under these conditions. I don't know if any everyone would call that actually living. It's not, <laughs> it's kind of I don't know. Surviving. I'm not sure what kind of life that <laughs> is. But now look at the leaves. Look how green those leaves are. Yeah. But it's only got like three of them. Hey, like, I mean, you know what? That's like looking at looking like someone. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to go there. But yeah, they, it doesn't look years. healthy. Come on. <laughs> hey, it's in a studio. You know what? It's yeah. a, it's a, how many living plants do I have in here? I think that's it. <laughs> yeah, it is. It really is. That would be it. But um, what other? What other things? Because you grow some things in your um, fish tank that yeah, actually... I, actually, I have uh, Lucky Bamboo is growing in there okay. underwater. I did have Pothos years ago that that did okay. Uh-huh. And then I They're found... All, those are only temporary, though. They only... Uh, they won't grow on in there forever. What? They lasted about... Both of those? Well, John brings yeah. up a good point. They la- In the fish tank, it lasted about a month or two. Yeah. And then they started to look really tired. Oh, really? And the fact that they are poisonous, they can be poisonous, it didn't affect the water. But it, it, th- that grand but experiment didn't go over well. A lot well. of philodendrons or plants in the philodendron family have oxalic acid yes. crystals in them. Yeah. And and you have to watch. Uh, matter of fact, the the monstera, the split leaf philodendron, has a delicious fruit. Have you ever tasted it? No, but I, really I know it's monstera good. deliciosa. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's uh, kind of like a pineapple-y tropical Ooh, yeah, fruit I love taste. Pineapple. But in between each segment, when you when it's ripe, you'll see some of those black oxalic acid crystals. Oh yeah. So you got to make sure you. Pull those out. Yeah, those aren't good. There's some semi-aquatic plants that do well in aquariums as well. Yeah. The same kind that you could put into a terrarium if you, yeah. you know, or any kind of reptile environment. There's um, there's some, like, mossy kind of ground covers as well. Is is lotus one that can kind of have its roots all the way wet all the time? Isn't it? I feel like a I've lotus seen... Lotus is a water plant. I feel like... Well, what kind of No, the parrot's can... beak. The parrot's beak. I feel like yeah. I've seen it along, like pond edges and things like that before i'm not really sure no okay no because that's one but of lotus, those water lotus that if is you different. overwater it it's dead yeah, if you underwater true. it it's dead. it's dead yeah it's very that, that's critical. that's a fine line yeah. but but i feel like you you're talking about the terrariums there's a lot of little ferns and things that do tolerate their roots being wet all the time yeah this is interesting i had a plant a couple of weeks ago in the aquarium uh a new plant that i purchased I, I believe I've had that species before, but for some reason, the fish ate it. They were going up to it and nibbling on it. Really? And it just kind of fell apart and disintegrated. The leaves floated to the surface. So I bought another one. I said, well, how come this is the only one you're eating? Yeah. Same thing happened. But they leave the rest alone. Interesting. I have no idea why. I wish yeah. I could remember the species. You know, you know, which is another plant that's super funny um, with watering, and you would think it would be easy because you think you just water it all the time and be fine. It's maidenhair ferns. 
Made in hair ferns. They need really good drainage, otherwise, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, you think you, you know, it's always in a damp environment, loves the shade, should be okay. But whenever you try to actually grow one, yeah. it, it fights you every way possible. <laughs> I was, um, Dana mentions, by the way, that Brian has an octopus's garden in his fish tank. Yeah, I should take a picture. It's, it looks good in there. Fish, fish are loving it. Yeah. A little... They're all doing well, too. That's why I start to get suspicious. The longer they live, it's like, how long is this going to go on? When you walk out there and they're I, all I floating. Mean, <laughs> by all rights, there are some species that should live anywhere from two to five years. Yeah. So, I remember how, um, I, I, I think I've said this a few times before, but when we were, I think it was Monaco, right, that uh, we saw a, a um, sculpture by a famous sculptress of an octopus. It was a bronze sculpture. In the octopus's garden. And it was in a right garden there. by the sea. Exactly. And I was thinking that's that's exactly where that's And there song was a yellow from. submarine in there. And there was a yellow submarine and there too. And that was right outside the cathedral. It, it was a museum. Right. And I think it was Monaco. It was Monaco. Yeah. Because I think I have a picture of you in front of the yellow mm -hmm. submarine. Mm -hmm. And then there was a seagull that kept following me. Because I fed this seagull, so then we would walk a little bit and turn around. There it was, and, yeah. he, and he would land and like, okay, here's some more, and he found us no matter where we went. That was Jonathan Livingston, right? Yeah. <laughs> I think he died back in the '80s. Um, was he with the flock of seagulls? <laughs> oh. All right. Um, now what? Oh, I was going to mention when we were talking about fireflies that. Uh, he was talking about the patterns, right? Mm -hmm. That the, each, the glow patterns. Each, yeah, each species has a different glow pattern. It's like a language. Yeah, and I'm not positive, but I think he, I think there were some that learned how to mimic the glow patterns of other fireflies to attract them, so they could eat them. It's interesting. That might not be true. I might have made that up, but I seem to remember. It's a good reading story. That. If you made that yeah. up, that's a good story. Yeah, <laughs> that's okay. So you said that that along with um, seeing fireflies in Indianapolis, that uh, you saw a lot of bats. Yeah, same time every night. At night, and what fruit? I would imagine fruit bats for the most part. I don't no, know. Very, no, very, very rarely. I don't think you see fruit. No, those bats. are more tropical. Yeah. They're, they really? they're more the bats that eat bugs. You know, mosquitoes, the mosquitoes, so flies. What did, you, what did you see? You know what was interesting is that uh, that Ben said that the fireflies are out from nine thirty to ten. Yeah, only out for an hour. Yeah. Well, if you only lived a week, you know. <laughs> well, there's a curfew that they adhere to. I mean, as, as Tiger it, mentioned, you live a couple of weeks, you're kind of on a yeah on a very, schedule. And, and if and very, if you have to yes, breathe a certain pattern in order for other fireflies to know what you are, you can only sustain that for a while. Now, okay, so I might have missed this in the conversation because, like John, my mind does wander. What do fireflies do? What is the purpose? What is that two week purpose? To How breed. Do, that's yeah. it. That's it. But, but but once they breed and they're living, what do they do? No, they're no, they're, they're more important than larvae. They're only state. two weeks. They're they're more important than the larvae state. And so in the larvae state, that's when they're. Eating decaying matter, they're eating okay. the ground bugs, eating that, snails, e eating like snails. He said like it, what, two years up to up to yeah, a year up, to two years, right? Like you say, and and then they have to overwinter because you know these areas get snow, you know, get frozen right. soil. So you know you you have to be able to overwinter that mm -hmm. time. Um, so they're more important, and, and just like people think, like oh, ladybugs, they they say introduce ladybugs, they eat aphids, they eat the bugs in the garden. And they do, they do a good job of it. But the more aggressive eaters are actually the larva ladybugs. Right. So you actually right. want more larva of the ladybugs than actual ladybugs because the larva are the ones that are truly eating all of the population of aphids. Right. So that's the kind of same thing with the fireflies is it seems like they're more important to the ecosystem in the um, larva state. Because right. it doesn't seem like – like we talk about, like it doesn't seem like bats eat them. doesn't seem like birds eat the, the – No, larva. nothing the, eats them. Nothing eats right. the actual Except adult. other fireflies. <laughs> <laughs> that was right. pretty crazy. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. So, it, it seems like they're very important in the larva state. Yeah. Hastam wants to know how to attract them to your garden. And I think the best recommendation would be to go to fireflies.org. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I notice you keep saying .org. Uh, instead, instead of, of .org, org, is 
I, I, I just, just feel like saying uh, saying org is is weird. To it's me. a weird word. Right. You know what? Because yeah. you have you have to give that G sound at the end. Yeah. Org. Otherwise, org. it's dot org. Dot what? Dot yeah. org. Yeah. I deal with it all the time when I read commercials, yeah. whether it's dot com or dot org. I make sure to get that org in there. Yeah. Dot org. Well, the huh? reason I asked is because you're the tech guy, and I didn't know if that was the proper way to do it, or you were just no. I'm, I'm just trying to make sure I don't sound weird. Sound you feel free, John, to dorky. call it whatever you want. <laughs> if you yeah. want to be an O R G right. or an org, but so guy. it's fireflies dot org or dot org, org, and all kinds of tips on how to attract them into yeah. your yard. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but a lot of it involves native species of plants, right? right. That. Um, you know, are more kind of your water area. plants. We're going to take well. a break. Uh, those on Facebook Live, BizTalk Radio, we're going to take a break for our friends on BizTalk Radio, for our great sponsors. So as we say, usually every show, back after these messages on BizTalk Radio. Stay with us. Okay, we are back from the break. Thank you for hanging in there. Those on Facebook Live, those on BizTalk Radio, thank you very much. Our topic today, for the most part, fireflies. Ben Pfeiffer was our guest, a great guest, and filled us in on a lot of things in terms of how they live, how they survive, how they communicate, what they eat, how they glow, why they glow. That was pretty much it. You know, by the way, Ben's a good example of if you have a passion for something and you just follow your passion. dive into it. I'm, I mean, you can be, you know, even if it, yeah. <laughs> it's not a big deal, like who would think, you know, okay, in, in college, I'm going to, I'm just going to go after fireflies. Yeah. <laughs> I love everything about them. Uh, but you think that's not really practical. But here, you know, you've got someone who's done it. He's probably one of the world's leading authorities on fireflies. And most right? people like us were very interested. Those on BizTalk, those on Facebook Live. Yeah. yeah. What about fireflies? And, and it's funny about, because about when about I was that. trying to schedule the interview, um, you know, he goes off. He goes off into the, the the mountains or wherever he is, and so he's out of connection for a week or he's two off at a the time. Grid. Yeah, oh, wow. and and so he's in there actually studying these. And it's funny that you say that because, you know, I was going to comment on how it it always blows my mind today when there's things that we still don't have answers to, mm-hmm. and and especially something as interesting as fireflies to me. I mean. Ben did provide a lot of answers, why they why they glow, how they glow, what they eat, where they live. But even to say, why can't they live in Southern California? They still don't know why. I mean, you know, they, they don't, you know, I'm you know, sure they can break it down to, you know, it's an arid environment, different things. But they still don't have a solid answer as far as why they can't live here in Southern California. Usually you, the answer would be, in a lot of cases, food source. Yeah. Do but, they have what they need to survive here or wherever? Like, why? Why? What about Hawaii? Well, that's what I'm saying. I mean, it seems like we have a food source. We have water, even though we're well, not. We don't have our rich organic soils like they do. And you've true. got if most of their life is, is in the larval stage in the lawns, and that's and what they need like that when they're that young. We also don't have anywhere near the amount of lawns they have back there, mm-hmm. back east. So sure. I think I think environment obviously. Yeah, but that's degree. why I was asking if you could create yeah. a, a habitat for them and that's then what, bring them could in. Could you create like a greenhouse and and put everything they need within that greenhouse? Right. I, you know, I mean, put a lawn in the it, greenhouse. I, John. I, I I can almost well, guarantee they're figuring out a way to do that in Dubai. What? Well, what would be the point of the <laughs> to create greenhouse? a microclimate for them? Well, why can't you just do it out in the yard? We They've tried that; it doesn't work. Store. Remember, that's what we're talking about. It doesn't work. I didn't know they had Brian, tried it. <laughs> Brian, want, Brian wants to live in a yeah. bubble. Hawaii, Japan, you know, didn't work. I think they were very successful in Japan, as I recall. Ex- except for the industry, right? <laughs> right, you the were, d- dirty yep. industry and pollution. Yeah. You know, halfway up from the base of Mount Fuji, halfway up, it's like fireflies as far as the eye can see. Why do you brag about your hikes that you've taken? <laughs> <laughs> I've never been to Japan. I would like to go sometime, though. Hey, did you see our buddy, uh, uh, Matthew, his latest uh, trip where they're taking everybody? Uh-uh. No. New Zealand. Oh, yeah, I did see that. You did see that, huh? You know, that's got to be an expensive trip. I didn't look at the price. You but think, huh? The, I just saw, and it, it had to be an anomaly. There's got to be. And it was a garden trip. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But I had just seen... Uh, uh, 
plane ticket, and it was coached to New Zealand for $3,800. Oh, wow. And I was telling my wife, I can't believe that. Because usually, I mean, the last time I went to New Zealand, it was really expensive, and it was like $900. For for a one-way ticket? No, no, round, round trip. trip. That was round trip. See, that seems like a deal, I think. Yeah, but that was that was 30 years ago. I, I would say, I think, a couple years ago, pre-COVID, 1500 bucks for a flight. To New Zealand. To New Zealand and back. Yeah, see that? If you could get like uh, thirteen to 1500 that's yeah, what I, I would expect. But 38. 38 was, I was just crazy. So you could drop six grand for your airfare, hotel. Maybe that might work for a couple, 6000 Yeah, there's a couple places where, you know, like if you want to get a, a deal on a trip to Italy, you can get one for $699, includes airfare and like a week in hotels. Hostels. Yeah, <laughs> no, they're they're no, they're decent good. hotels. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But the the two places that always seem really expensive are New Zealand and uh, South Africa. If you go to Africa, those are always expensive. Now, what do they both have in common? They're both in the southern hemisphere, south of the equator, and they're both, would you say, not hard to get to, but off the beaten track. South Africa. Well, they're hard to south. get to from here. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah, it's a long way. It's a long trek. Yeah. yeah, I think when we went to New Zealand, we had we had two stops. We had one in Tahiti. Oh, how about mm-hmm. you? Not did it stop in Hawaii? No, no. Right. They usually do right to all Tahiti the way and over. Or we Japan, did Tahiti, and then we went from Tahiti to uh, Australia. Yeah, to Sydney or Brisbane, I think mm-hmm. two different two different places, yeah. and then from there to Auckland. That. That uh, is a trip I would love to take again, but it's just so darn expensive. Hmm. Oh. Yeah, times. Oh, We had well, friends who had, um, north of Auckland is a town called Kerry Kerry, and they had a, a farm uh, that they grew some, some type of uh, subtropical fruits on. But... At that time, you weren't allowed to to immigrate. You could own land, but you could not immigrate into New Zealand. Really? Unless you were a certain profession. Had to be a profession that they wanted. I remember when I was in high school uh, and then in college, almost went to Australia because they were paying you to go. They would, uh, if you wanted to, because they wanted people to immigrate there. You wanted there. people there, yeah. So they would they would pay for a one way ticket, <laughs> no round trips, incentive to stay there. Yeah, yeah. but now uh, now I guess they have plenty of people, and they don't want you to do that, or don't want people anymore. Wow, that's but but it would be nice. Yeah, but you didn't. Um, you've never you stopped in Tahiti, but you've never vacationed in Tahiti, right? Never vacationed, but it, we spent a few hours there. Got off the plane and. And there were just some Tahitian dancers. Of course. At the airport all <laughs> always, the time. Just always. always dancing. Yeah. Yeah. It's like when you get off the plane in Hawaii, right? Yeah. Okay. I always wanted to go. Uh, we couldn't quite swing it, but for our honeymoon, we were going to go. I wanted to go to Bora Bora, and we ended up in Hawaii. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, I would really like it to go to sounds, Bora Bora. It just sounds far away and exotic. Yeah. It? Where is Bora Bora? It's near Tahiti. Near Tahiti? Yeah. Bora Bora's got those. Uh, well, Tahiti has them too. Those, those uh, uh, hotels that you stay in that are the over the water oh, on the water on the water. And you, the, you can see it's like a glass the little bottom. grass huts and uh-huh, things. They that, go out about maybe half yeah. a mile. Yeah. Uh, um, boy, there's another group of islands, the the Maldives. Uh huh. You've heard of them, right? Yeah. Yeah, I've been to the Tahiti. Maldives. I've been to Fiji. The and, Maldives. Right? Maldives. Yeah. yeah right. Maldives. Yeah, which is kind of off the beaten path. And, yeah. Interesting. Hey, it is break time, so we're going to take a break. We have two more segments coming up. So those on uh, Facebook Live, uh, plenty of time for questions, comments. You can take this show in any direction. It doesn't have to be a Firefly question. It could be a question about New Zealand. It could be a question about expensive airfare. That's why we're here, John. So we're going to take mm. a break. Gina says that she gets immigration offers all the time from New Zealand. She used to live there. Yes, she did. All right, break time here. Back after these messages on Biz Talk Radio.
Okay, we have returned. If you're watching us on Facebook Live, that was a quick break, right? Wish they could all be that uh, that quick. But uh, we do have to uh, take our hats off to our sponsors on BizTalk Radio. Thank you so much for supporting BizTalk Radio and Garden America, John. Wow. Two things at once. You want three? <laughs> well, two's the start. <laughs> Gina says that uh, uh, she gets immigration offers from New Zealand all the time, so... Maybe it's switched from Australia to New Zealand now. She said that they're they're looking for people in in different trades. You know, when we were in New Zealand, we were in um, oh, I'm trying to think of the name of the town. It's in the Bay of Islands, and there was a we uh, took a little uh, tour with a woman in a van, you know, driving around Russell, which was the old capital of New Zealand, I think. And she was talking about how expensive things were getting to be. And she said, you won't believe what an acre on the ocean costs now. <laughs> and, and this was how long ago? Uh, it's about 30 years ago. Oh, okay, okay. And I, she said, just prices had skyrocketed. Nobody can afford it. <laughs> For an acre on the ocean, $30,000. <laughs> absurd. <laughs> well, was funny. it wasn't too long ago when... A house in Pacific Beach was twenty five, thirty grand. Oh, that was long ago. Hey, so um, it depends Pat, on your frame of reference. Yeah. Patty sent us a, a photo of she has a pothos very similar to your situation in a glass jar, I'm just sitting there okay, doing just whatever. There. But hers looks to be at least in a window sill. So, well, yeah, I'm gonna, I mean, I yeah, mean, I, this we, is. I'm, I want to show this. Let me see if I can get we, it. To we have all the wrong environment here. Look at in this, this in this studio. Look at all those leaves, healthy looking roots. Not all dirty good. water. And then, and then we have. Now, I changed that water a week this. ago, actually. And then we have this. I don't, let me see. Is there? Oh, oh, no, the roots are still attached. Oh, yeah. They are still, and again, I, again I, wanna, I, I changed that water I wanna, a week ago. I don't want to tug it too hard. They'll fall off. <laughs> I think Tiger's making fun of you. No, but, I would make fun of it, too. Yeah. I mean, it's been there. Just I'm, I'm amazed by it. That it can see? live that long. You see? It's called a green thumb. <laughs> I would give you kudos if I had any. <laughs> um, what was That was like a ga a bar, right? A kudos ku bar? Kudos, was it? So I know, is, isn't it a, a, a protein bar? bar? Like a granola bar or something? Um, and then this morning, John, do you remember the uh, the few weeks ago, probably more than that, a month ago, Tiger gave me that hibiscus? Oh, man. Chocolate oh, brown. Oh yeah, maple maple sugar. Maple sugar that I, I <laughs> chocolate brown. <laughs> I transplanted it into a bigger pot. Right. The thing is getting so big, and I'm just so amazed. Have at you that. pruned it back at all? What's that? Have you pruned it? No. You need to. You know why? Should Be I? Because it's going to get leggy. Because it's it's starting to get wide. Yeah, they do that. I can do that. Yeah, if you cut them back, you'll you'll they'll branch. From wherever you cut it, you'll get two, usually two branches. So just cut the so, branch. Just go. Yeah, how go, far down do you think? You just, can go as much as halfway if you want. Okay, because it, it's once I transplanted it, it's it's just going on. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. You want it to be book, bushier. Yeah. So, but I just love it. You walk by, you have to stop and look at it each time. And I he saw says, you Wait hugging it one day. What's that? You were hugging it one day. He you says loved when it they so start much. to bloom, you have to look really carefully because you won't see the flower. It's the same color. Yeah. And there's. Small flowers compared to the tropical okay. hibiscus. And I will I will cut it back, if not today, before the weekend is over. Well, there you go. You're not going to get as hot as I am, right? <laughs> That's always been my dream, but uh, <laughs> probably no. If, if, you're, if you're 98, we'll be 89. Okay, so 10 90, degrees maybe. cooler, maybe. Well, whether it's hot or not, now's the time to start planting your winter vegetables from seed. Not plants necessarily. If you're going to put in tomatoes, it's already too late. Uh-oh. So don't. Actually, uh, I would probably um, Google whatever area you're in, uh, winter gardens, you know, uh, vegetables to plant Type now. in your zone. Yeah, don't go to a uh, home improvement center and look at their vegetable display. They'll sell you oh, everything. Because they have, uh, I would say, as much as... 30%, maybe even up to 50% of what's there right now will not grow and produce. They're probably selling cucumbers right now. They're just getting rid of everything. <laughs> well, they sell them all winter. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> cucumbers, squash, yeah. Uh, melons, none of that stuff sh should be planted now. Peppers. Yeah, peppers none of those. the worst. 
Yeah. And it, while tomatoes might still grow, they're not going to fruit. Fruit. So yeah. I think I, we've got about as much as we can off our little cherry tomatoes this yeah. year. We're Picked done. It clean. Done. We're done. We were talking. Uh, I told you we went to a birthday party on Thursday, and uh, we were the people, uh, friends of ours, who were talking about their garden, and they were mentioning how good their tomatoes were and how great they were. And and I was telling them, you know, Shannon mentioned, well, we put in a garden, we didn't get anything. And I said, you know. <laughs> It, it was, Throwing John under the wow. bus. It was ill-conceived from the beginning. I yeah. didn't plan it. Yeah. Uh, Jesse and Shannon planted it. And, yeah, and, like how she drags you into yeah, the weed. Exactly. Yeah. We, we planted it. And we, we, got, we got virtually nothing. But I said, um, you know what's funny is that we put in three tomato plants. Uh, they were in a, a raised planter, which they shouldn't have been. One on legs, so it was up tall, so that these three plants took over the whole thing, <laughs> growing out over the sides. Uh, I think we have one possibly uh, possible tomato that <laughs> <laughs> that has part, you know, a little slit on the side that doesn't look good. So we haven't gotten anything. But yesterday I was pulling weeds on the hillside, and there was this cherry tomato yep. that had come up from seed. Has hundreds of fruits on it, yeah. getting ready to ripen. And I was telling our friends, I said, you know, our garden wasn't that great, but God's garden yeah. <laughs> was fantastic. Out of it's control. loaded with all kinds of tomatoes. And, and you picked them? Well, they're not quite ripe not yet. Ready. Okay. But the wow. problem is, is that when they do go ripe, you're going to go out there that morning and they're going to be gone. Really? Because whatever animals are there are just also scoping those. Mm -hmm. Man, that's that's always the worst. Is and I would think like you know you say that tomato's hidden in there. Nobody knows where it's at. It's been growing just fine. Right. And then you, what do you think you're giving it? Another week for them to ripen up? How many days? With the seed? Yeah, maybe a week. A week. Let's yeah. see. I, I'll be interested. Report back see, if next next show grab it before John if, does. If, if something just leaves those tomatoes on there or if they start getting eaten up within this week. Well, I don't know where they came from. So uh, last year I had a volunteer that I put in a huge cage and let grow up, and it had tons of ripe fruit on it. But my wife said they tasted horrible. Oh, bummer. So I, I pulled it out. And I don't know. The only tomato that we had near where this one's growing was the the uh, the one from 1898, uh, Thornburn's Terracotta. Oh, yeah. Uh, but this is a cherry, this so I don't know if it came from that yeah. or not. It's possible. Yeah, interesting. Brian Milley says that when she was growing up, uh, she remembers that they had Tradescantia in water. Oh, yeah. Yeah, a lot of yeah. wandering Jews were really popular, the yep. wandering Jews. Back in the Old Testament days? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in Moses' time. Yeah. But the, uh, the Tradescantias back then were hugely popular. Those and but, but we called one, them Swedish Ivy in Michigan, but I, I think here they called them Creeping Charlies. But I think Charlies, um, exactly yeah. that one it, it requires light to do like, well. Yeah, like, like it couldn't Shouldn't do what this the, requires yeah. some light. Well, no, I mean these honestly, like they don't require a lot of light. Pothos they can right. tolerate very low light. They can tolerate just fluorescent light environments. They don't require but, anything. But the well, they uh, do need some light. I mean, the, if you never turned the light on in here, yeah, it would. And yeah. came back five years later, it'd be good. <laughs> five five years. years, okay. I'll give you. I'll yeah, give but you the five tra years. Tradescantia, I've seen people do those in water, and if they have it in a bathroom where it's all dependent upon artificial light, right. then they don't do they don't do well in there. But in a a room with a window or in a windowsill, yeah. they do excellent. They do. Yeah. There was. They were really popular for a while, and. I'm not in retail anymore, so I don't know if people are still bad mm -hmm. are uh, using them. But they had those glass balls, the rooters that would hang on a string. Oh yeah, uh -huh. and do they still sell those? Yeah, or? yeah, they're kind of like little. And you put little you put cuttings. just little cuttings in there and yeah. let them just yeah just change them out like flowers or yeah. whatever as you yeah. see fit. Yeah, yeah, and wandering Jews would be good for those. Yeah, or pothos, pothos. Get to be a little heavy though. The wandering Jews were a little lighter. Yeah, and and then the the Tradescantia you can get the green, the purple, the tricolor. Those tricolors those are cool. always amaze me because of that hot pink, you know, <laughs> color yeah. that's in there. Yeah, so you and can I get a little bit more. I also like color. the fuzzy leafed one. 
I was going to say, and they have a texture to the leaf. Yeah. All of them have a little bit of a fuzz. Yeah. Okay, we're going to take a break. We have one more segment coming up. So Facebook Live, questions, comments, whatever's on your mind. A lot of comments coming in right now. Lenore's Wandering Jew is huge. Doesn't stop growing. It's things like that that we like to read here. Yeah. Back after these messages on Biz Talk Radio. All right, we are back, and this is our final segment for whatever time you're listening. If it's live, we well, it couldn't be live if you're BizTalk Radio. It's pre-recorded, but we're live right now as we speak on Facebook Live. I like um, to see John's head explode when I discuss that. There's a comment on uh, our thread about a um, Kevin with a bagged product, the soil, and then he said tomatoes would come out of it. Is right? Is that what he's saying? That was the old Kellogg's nitri humus. Yeah, and that's an interesting thing because. You know, in the in the retail industry, um, and I'm not saying it's not true. I'm just saying um, a lot of people look for a reason for something happening, a plant dying, weeds. Yeah, what is the weeds, reason? Weeds coming up after they worked an area and right. they planted it, right? And um, basically all soil products, bag soil products, compost products, have been composted to the point where their internal temperatures have been um, brought to a temperature that is hot enough to sterilize right. any any seed matter, whether it be a tomato or a weed or plant in the soil. So when you put it down, you shouldn't get weeds to come up. Now, there are less expensive soils out there that maybe don't do a good right. a job as that. Um, that used to be a big problem here in San Diego. We have our landfill where they have the greenery, and they would basically do their best to compost it. But you would buy this compost from the greenery, put it around your garden, and next thing you know, you have weeds popping up all over. Um, and they just didn't do the process well enough. And um, you know, but I would say for bagged products, um, they kind of hold them to a little higher standard. So I think that that's kind of a difficult thing for um, you to say that this bagged product had weeds or yeah. seed matter in it that came up from it. But well, I remember um, remember Worm Gold Plus. Yep. Yep. And yep. Worm Gold, you know, worm castings was great, but I remember um, using it during a certain period of time. Like during the white fly scare? It was during about a year where they uh, maybe not composting as well as Tiger's saying, and you would spread it down and you would get nettles. Mm-hmm. Uh, stinging nettles came up everywhere. Yeah. Which you could then cook, I guess, if you yeah. wanted to. But um, but no, I mean, it, it, you know, it is possible that it does happen. And, you know, it just means that the, the soil was not composted enough or not brought to a hot enough temperature to sterilize the soil. I mean, that's what happens with people that do their own backyard compost bins all the time. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I don't I don't know of any backyard composter that's good enough to bring their compost pile up to that temperature to, to get rid of all the to completely yeah. sterilize everything they put in there. What if you used a flamethrower? <laughs> no, because <laughs> even then you have to bring the whole pile. All yeah. you're going to be doing is just charring the edges. Yeah. You'd have to have it in like some kind of heater, like incubator. Do you know anything about mammoth um, spinach? No. I was going to say mammoth sunflowers. but I know woolly mammoth. Yeah. Mammoth spinach. The woolly mammoths they're trying to bring back, right? Right. Maybe is that what they used to eat is mammoth spinach? I don't know. So they're trying to bring back the mammoth spinach before the woolly mammoth? No? No. Someone's (laughs) going to have their own version of Jurassic Park before too long. You wait. Oh, it's going to be happening in Mission Valley. You didn't see that? No, seriously. You know, they they set up one of those big tents in the Mission Valley Mall parking lot. For Halloween? No, it's it's they're going inside that tent. They're bringing in the animatronic dinosaurs 
so you can walk through it as if you're in Jurassic okay. Park. Okay, animatronic. Yeah. Okay, all right. That's yeah. a step in the right direction. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> it's not. I. It doesn't come up online, so I don't. Doesn't know. exist. Maybe you made it up. Yeah. Maybe not. You dreamed. Well, it. someone asked me about it during the week, and I said, you know, I really don't know anything about that. Usually, this the spinaches they put in now are. I think the common one is uh, Bloomsdale Long Standing. Yep. Something like that. It's good for the winter. Spinach is a good cool season crop. Mm-hmm. Excellent. That's the kind of thing. Spinach, all your lettuces. Uh, uh, you can do carrots, radishes. Spinach is excellent too because it doesn't bolt like a lettuce or like other leafy greens as much. You know, there are certain varieties. That's why Bloomsdale is yeah. called long standing because it doesn't bolt as quickly. Yeah. We, we have a cat that loves spinach. Just we can go to the refrigerator, get the bag out. Cats in there waiting before we to eat the spinach. Eat the and now you try to fool them with salad, like just a regular like a green leafy lettuce. Wants nothing to do with it. It's really? got to be a. Spinach. You pull that leaf spinach leaf out, goes to town. Really goes to town. That's just, Popeye, right? Is that what you call the cat? Does uh, it does it like pop the can open? And... I wish, right? <laughs> but yeah, it's amazing, and and knows when we go to the refrigerator, that's what we're getting out. Oh, really? But I've tried to give him, you know, lettuce and other. Nope. Nothing Once else, the spinach. Huh? Once the good stuff. Yeah. Well, spinach is the healthier of all of those right. things, right? It's got well, yeah, more vitamins, more let, minerals. Let's be honest. I've heard people talk about, you know, oh, iceberg lettuce, and it's good for you. Nothing Iceberg in it. lettuce has how much nutritional value, really? It's like celery. Yeah. It's like it's if you want to lose weight, eat this. It's like it's not. I think, I, yeah, I think they say it takes more energy to eat it than right. it, what it you gives burn you. burn up more calories chewing it than you <laughs> than are in the yeah. vegetable itself. Yeah, whenever I hear itself. somebody getting off on iceberg lettuce, I go, you know what? Mm, probably not doing to your body what you think it is. Yeah. Usually the more bitter a lettuce is, the healthier it is yeah. for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A lot of the radicchios... Um, are really bitter uh, unless you get them when they're they're real young. But they they're loaded with all kinds of nutrients. Yeah, the mez mez mezclin mixes, mezclin mezclin Me, mez. How do you say it, John? It's a, mezclin. It's a drug. M e z m e z c l m e s c l u n. Yeah, c l u n mezclin. Well, boys. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and all the little animals who are gathered around the radio and <laughs> Facebook Do you have any roses blooming right now? Do I? Ooh. Yes. Hey, well, Laura Bush one? is blooming. Um, uh, Nimbus is blooming. Um, Lemon Spice is blooming. Pope John Paul is blooming. I think that covers it. You know what happened yesterday at my house is they were putting up our solar panels. Uh-oh. And you dropped oh, the one no. on a rose. I went out the back. <laughs> one. <laughs> one would be fine. They... They put the ladders up against the house, right? We got we got to go. We're on time here, so hurry up. And they kicked the kicked the rose bushes out of the way to get their ladders in. My God! And then roses. cement tiles falling off the roots, smashing into roses. Oh no! I still haven't did you, did recovered you, everything. Did you Have you kick addre- him off the did ladder? Did you address it as, with him as he came down? It was too late. You yeah. know, by the time I got there and saw, I was like, just pulled the know, ladder from him. Well, we're going to leave you point? on that negative note today. Thank you, John. Hey, thank you for tuning in. Uh, whether it's uh, Facebook Live or BizTalk Radio, we really appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Enjoy the upcoming week, and we'll do it again next week right here for the entire crew. Tiger Palafox, I'm Brian Maine. John Begnesco, be safe and get growing. America, take care.